Thank you very much. So uh, great to be here. Um, really a legendary place. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. So I would like to talk about uh, a little bit exotic topic, which uh, we call geometric deep learning, basically how to apply, uh, um, uh, how to generalize neural network architectures to non-Euclidean structured data. And uh, actually inspired by, by uh, a talk uh, two days ago, I tried to generate automatically a, an abstract for this talk. And it, uh, I, I've seen some interesting suggestions by uh, using this uh, website, Talk to a Transformer. So basically, why do we need um, geometric deep learning? Um, most of the data that the uh, that, uh, machine learning community has uh, so far uh, considered uh, it has some assumption of underlying Euclidean uh, structure, whether it's images, which can be thought as functions on grids, or uh, one-dimensional acoustic signals and, uh, or, or, or text sequences. But uh, in many applications, we have data that uh, doesn't have these grid-like structures. So we, for example, uh, dealing with social networks. So these, the, these are very large-scale graphs where users are nodes and uh, edges represent uh, relations or interactions. We can model molecules, as we'll see uh, later on in this talk, as, as graphs as well. Different uh, networks, basically graphs are very abstract uh, models for any system of relations or interactions. And uh, basically, you can, roughly speaking, can uh, think of anything as a graph. In computer graphics and computer vision, uh, we also model three-dimensional objects as, uh, as meshes. So again, think of graphs with some extra structure. And uh, there are many applications where uh, Basically, using uh, applying deep learning techniques on this kind of data uh, can be very beneficial. And uh, we had a paper with a uh, few collaborators, including Joan Bruna, who is uh, uh, who is also a member here this year, uh, where we uh, called it uh, geometric deep learning. And uh, basically, nowadays there are many uh, many works in in this field uh, uh, that that has really become very popular. And there are many applications where, you can, uh, where these methods have been applied successfully uh, from recommender systems. So I, uh, I have a part-time position at Twitter where we use these methods uh, to, uh, to, to do recommendation of content uh, uh, for users. Uh, different applications in particle physics. Uh, we had a work also with Joan on uh, neutrino detection in the Ice Cube uh, Observatory. Uh, there are uh, physicists that work on the Large Hadron Collider where they model uh, uh, particle jets as, as graphs and do event classification. Uh, social networks. So uh, I had a startup that was uh, looking at uh, detecting misinformation on social networks from the way that, uh, that uh, news spread. You can detect uh, fake news with high accuracy. So that, that company was acquired by Twitter and that's how I ended up there. Very interesting applications in, uh, in uh, biomedicine, for example, uh, work uh, from Stanford from last year uh, that uh, modeled uh, side effects between drugs uh, using protein-to-protein uh, -protein and drug-to-protein interaction networks, and so on and so forth. So there are many interesting applications in chemistry where you can model molecules as, as graphs, maybe with some extra structure. So these are just a few examples, but uh, applications are really numerous and very interesting and probably in some fields, uh, these methods can, can provide significant uh, breakthrough. So today, I would like to focus mainly on uh, dealing with three-dimensional data, with geometric data. And uh, also, geometric deep learning has been used uh, uh, recently in fields like computer graphics and computer vision, mainly in problems related to, to uh, virtual and augmented reality, robotics, autonomous driving, uh, interesting medical applications where you have three-dimensional structures coming from, for example, uh, uh, MRI or, or CT data, and drug design. So that, 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 that will be the part that I would like to talk uh, about extensively, basically dealing with proteins. So let me just give you an idea of uh, the typical applications that are uh, uh, dealt with in computer graphics and computer vision, and uh, it will be a prototype for some of the problems that, uh, that, that we also encounter in proteins. So. I will start with, uh, let's say, a broad description of the algorithms, but then we dive uh, uh, deeper into the, the specific problem of protein design. So this is an example of application that uh, is called markerless motion capture. So you see here, basically, an actor is performing in front of a 3D sensor. And uh, the, the motion of his face is uh, transferred in real time to this animated character. So you probably heard about motion capture. It's used in movie production. But usually, it's a very big setup that requires very expensive sensors. So here, this is just very cheap uh, 3D sensor that, uh, uh, that 
cost maybe thirty dollars. That was another company that that I was involved in uh, that was acquired by Intel uh, eight years ago. Uh, basically, if you look at this problem, uh, it involves actually two problems. We can call them analysis and synthesis. So the first problem is we have some canonical body or canonical face in this case, and we want to find correspondence between this noisy partial corrupt input to this canonical face or body shape. Right? So that's the correspondence problem, right, or the analysis problem. The second problem, once we found this correspondence, we want to generate a new pose for this canonical face. So basically, we want to uh, we want to synthesize uh, a new uh, a new pose. Basically, find the positions of the points of, of, of this canonical mesh. So uh, let me start from this problem, and uh, then I will uh, I will talk about the the, the the mesh generation as well. So when dealing with 3D data, we have uh, a plenty of choices for uh, representing the data. This is what makes it different from let's say, image analysis, where in most cases you think of an image as just an array of pixels. So we can think of 3D objects as collections of two-dimensional views, right? Or uh, in some applications like medical data, it is very convenient to think of, uh, of 3D data as volumes. Basically, you have uh, an array of three-dimensional pixels. Uh, in computer vision applications, when, for example, the data comes from a LiDAR sensor, uh, it is convenient to work with point clouds. So you have just a set of three-dimensional of points with three-dimensional coordinates. And in computer graphics, uh, models designed by CAD programs uh, are usually represented as meshes, basically polygonal, uh, polygonal structures, discrete manifolds. So all of these representations uh, could be used in, uh, uh, with deep learning approaches. And there, there is a zoo of different architectures that work with multiple views, with volumetric representations, with point clouds and so on and so forth. In, in this particular application uh, the, the, that we've seen with, uh, with, with motion capture, what I, would, I hope to convince you that it is much more meaningful to work with, with surface-based representations, with meshes. And the reason is that we want our filters to be invariant to deformations. If you think of this deforming surface and you, you look at it as, as an image, Right? And you apply some standard convolutional uh, neural network. So what I visualize here is the response of the filter. You see that when the surface deforms, uh, I will get completely different results. Right? And let alone a deformation invariance, we don't have even invariance to rotations, to rigid transformations. Right? So convolutional neural networks are not invariant to rotations. What we want to do instead, we want to design uh, the filters on the surface itself. We want them to be invariant to deformations. So we want uh, some intrinsic analogy of uh, of convolution operation, okay, and obviously you can understand why we want to do it. We uh, you can think of it as as a natural evolution. Uh, basically, when we have some uh, problem uh, specific uh, um, invariance property that that we, that we would like to preserve. So that was, uh, for example, uh, the one of the reasons for success of convolutional neural networks, uh, where the, the convolutional filters can be derived from uh, from shift invariance. There are some more recent generalizations to, to, uh, to, to general group uh, actions. And uh, here we want to extend it to non-Euclidean domains, to manifolds. So basically, we built this deformation invariance into the, uh, into the uh, architecture of the neural network. Uh, if you think of convolutional neural networks, basically, uh, there are two basic ingredients. Uh, this is convolution and pooling, right? And, uh, the, the important thing in terms of the computational complexity, this is what makes uh, uh, convolutional neural networks efficient, is first the number of parameters that is independent on the input size. We can apply them on very large uh, uh, images because uh, the, the weights are shared across locations. And uh, the complexity is linear in the input size. So we want, uh, 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 for non-Euclidean domains, we also want uh, these properties to hold. So one of the main difficulties is that uh, we don't have shift invariance property. It's basically a, a manifold or a graph is not a vector space. So if uh, in the Euclidean case, we can think of a convolution as just extracting a patch and uh, multiplying it by some template, uh, basically I can think of uh, extracting this patch at different locations of the image. The very operation of extracting the patch is exactly the same. On, uh, uh, on a non-Euclidean domain on manifold or a graph, uh, we have to, to do something different. Even the number of points on a mesh uh, might be different. Yeah. Okay, so we'll 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 get there, right? So, okay. 
Yeah, yeah, of course. So that's that's one of the directions, right? So that's actually next slide. Basically, in the Euclidean setting, we have uh, two different options how we can define uh, convolution. We can define it uh, in the spatial domain or we can define it in the spectral domain, right? And the, the two views are equivalent. Basically, we know that convolutions are essentially uh, circulant matrices and uh, their eigen, uh, eigenvectors are uh, the Fourier transform. So convolutions are diagonalized by the Fourier transform. That's why in the, in the Fourier domain, we can uh, implement them as pointwise multiplication. So basically, we have two strategies uh, of generalizing uh, convolution-like operations to non-Euclidean domains. We can define an analogy of the Fourier transform on, uh, on the graph or on the manifold, or we can use some spatial construction. Okay, so let's start with this option. Basically, what is the analogy of, uh, of the, the, the Fourier transform? Again, if you think of the Euclidean setting, uh, you can think of uh, circulant matrices, they're all equivalent, they all commute, right? So they're all jointly diagonalized. And, uh, the eigenvectors, basically the, the eigenbasis of these matrices happens to be the eigenvectors of the shift operator, which is the Fourier transform. So Laplacian, for example, is, uh, is diagonalized by exactly the same, the same basis. Uh, we can define an, a Laplacian on a non-Euclidean domain, so this is uh, how it is defined on a mesh or on a graph. Basically, it, uh, it takes the difference between the value of, uh, uh, of a node i and the average, weighted average, of the neighborhood of a node. Right, so you can think of Laplacian as, as a way of measuring how the signal changes uh, locally on the graph. So basically, it's, it's, it's a criterion of smoothness, right? And you can use its eigenvectors as, uh, basically, it is symmetric, uh, positive semi-definite, so the, the uh, eigenvectors form orthogonal basis. Uh, you can use it as an analogy of the Fourier transform. And the eigenvalues are as the analogy of, of frequencies. And here is an example. So these are the first few eigenvectors of this, uh, of this uh, surface. So you see the first one is constant. Then uh, uh, as you go in higher frequency, the, here they are ordered in, by increasing order of the eigenvalues. You see that uh, uh, basically here the, the, the blue and the red represent positive and negative values. So the, the, the number of oscillations will, will increase. Yeah, so in this case, uh, assume that it, it is, exactly. Here you assume that the model is given, right? So WIJ, uh, some weights here. So you can, uh, you can compute them in different ways. You can think of them as distances between the vertices to be a, a, a correct discretization of the continuous Laplacian, what's called in differential geometry, the Laplace bill trami operator. There is some slightly more elaborate formula to compute them. It's the average of the cotangents of the angles opposite to, to this edge. And there are many other way, ways of, of discretizing. Is there any discrete operator on any weighted graph? So in this case, it's not a graph, it's a mesh. So that's why we have some extra structure. We have triangles. But on a graph, it will be, uh, uh, it will be some weights attached to each edge. OK? So bottom line, you can write it as a, a big sparse matrix. That is uh, symmetric if the graph is undirected, and it's, it has orthogonal eigenvectors. Okay, any questions? So the weight is actually the length of the node. So in, it can be it can be many things. So there there are many ways of, of doing it. Usually in meshes, in discrete meshes, if you want it also to, to represent the continuous operator and converge uh, to, the, to, the, to the continuous operator uh, under some technical conditions, it will be the average of the, the, the cotangents of these angles uh, divided by some area element, which is one third of the sum of the, the areas of the triangles that are shared by these, uh, uh, that share these, these vertex. Again, this is what is called the cotangent Laplacian, but there are, there are several other discretizations. Okay, bottom line, once you computed this uh, Laplacian, or any version of Laplacian, basically, once you computed its uh, eigenvectors and you can take a signal on, the, on your, or your mesh or your graph and project it on the, this basis, you, you can forget about how you exactly constructed the Laplacian. So you, you now work only with Fourier coefficients. Okay? And you can define uh, convolution in the, uh, as a pointwise product in the, in the Fourier domain, right? So, the projection on the basis, right, that is denoted here by phi transpose, gives you the Fourier transform of the signal. Then multiplication by this diagonal matrix gives you pointwise product. And then uh, inverse Fourier transform multiplication by the, by, by the matrix of eigenvectors phi. Okay? 
So basically, the, the, the simplest idea to, uh, to do non-Euclidean uh, convolutional neural networks would be to parameterize the filters using these coefficients. Okay? So basically, these are now the variables I want to learn them. There are many issues with this. So first of all, the number of parameters here is order of n and not, uh, not uh, order of 1. Uh, the filters are not necessarily localized. And the worst thing is that they, they don't generalize. So here is an example. We have some function on this surface. Right, so it's ones and zeros. And I apply some filter that does a kind of edge detection. Okay, so here is the filter. Basically, I compute it in the frequency domain. I compute the Fourier transform, some uh, matrix of coefficients, inverse Fourier transform. Okay? Now I perturb the domain slightly. What do you think will happen? Will the filter remain, uh, the, the result of the filter remain similar? So the, the, the signal is given, yeah. right? I computed the Fourier transform. So I computed the Laplacian and the Laplacian eigenvectors. I projected the signal on the Laplacian eigenvectors. Then I multiplied by diagonal matrix. Basically, these are the coefficients of the filter. And then I computed the inverse Fourier transform. OK, so now I, uh, I'm asking if I perturb the domain, if I start deforming this, this horse, what happens? Well, b both, right? So if I move xi and xj, inevitably uh, the weights will change slightly, right? Well, even with standard Fourier transform, you have some perturbation. The eigenvalues can be very sensitive. It depends on the, what type of perturbation. Okay, right. So, probably right. So, so we expect that uh, everything will uh, look completely different, right? And uh, exactly this is what happens, right? So that's when, when the horse moves, and even uh, if this is approximately isometric deformation, uh, we see that. Uh, it breaks completely. And the reason, obviously, is that uh, if we look at the at a given eigenvector, basically, the eigenvector uh, at the i's position, it might change, very, uh, it might change dramatically. It's even, not the, uh, even the sign of eigenvector is not, not defined, right? And what happens typically, especially at high frequencies, is that the, the order of eigenvalues can change. So uh, the, the, the 50th eigenvector will exchange position with the 51st, or something like this. And that's why, uh, basically, uh, the two domains have a completely different uh, vocabulary, if you want. Uh, the, the Fourier basis is, is completely different. So this is a bad idea to do it, yes? So the, the weights of the Graf-Laplacian thing is just because the deformation yeah. dictated what you would do. That's correct. If, if yeah. you would like, fix the weights for like, the canonical representation of the horse, and then uh, didn't change the weights, would, the, uh, like, would you still get this psychedelic image, or would you like, preserve the but uh, this, is, this is virtually impossible because meshes are rigid. Most of, mo most of, uh, uh, most of polyhedral uh, objects are rigid. So you cannot, if, if you were to construct them as uh, basically as pieces of metal, metal plates connected by hinges, they will not move. So any deformation of this kind inevitably changes, uh, inevitably introduces some distortion of the... Uh, the Well, if you use right, so if you if you keep the basis, if you keep the basis, then then uh, you don't have these problems. And in fact, in fact, if you assume that the graph is fixed, then uh, then uh, you can use uh, you can use spectral representation. Uh, that would be a good idea. The problem is that you cannot generalize to new graphs. I cannot wait. Uh, I cannot learn a set of filters on one graph or on one mesh and then apply it to to a new one. Even if it's you see here, if it's even very similar one. So here, even the connectivity is the same. Just the 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 weights of the of the edges change slightly the result is is dramatically different okay so a different idea would be not to 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 do uh, basically not to parameterize the filter as diagonal matrix of eigenvalues but to parameterize as, as a transfer function applied to the eigenvalues again think of eigenvalues as frequencies so basically this is equivalent to applying uh, some function to the laplacian itself and if i can express this function in terms of matrix uh, uh, and vector products like a polynomial, I actually don't need to compute the basis explicitly. I can just compute it as uh, powers of the Laplacian. You see it? So I can altogether avoid the, uh, the computation of phi, transpose in phi. Yep. So is it clear that eigenvalues and eigenvectors is a right notion for doing what we're trying to do? 
Not necessarily. So one of the big differences, uh, uh, one of the big differences between, uh, let's say, images and graphs, that you don't have uh, uh, interesting construction of uh, the geometry of the of the of the Fourier space. Basically, in uh, in images, because you can think of images as a, as a product of uh, two one-dimensional grids, right? You have a naturally notion of uh, horizontal and vertical frequency. You don't have uh, something similar on graphs. Basically, the the the, the, the space will be you just order the the, the, the eigenvalues uh, by their magnitude, for example. So uh, you have a very boring structure of the of the Fourier space. No, but what I'm also worried about is that the way you've set it up, you know, the Ws are sort of arbitrary, right? And that completely changes the spectrum and the uh, singular vectors and everything. Right? You mean W the the the, the matrix of yeah. of weights? So, it seems like a very fragile way to do things. Right. So, the, uh, so this way is, is not fragile. Here we can actually, so here we have multiple advantages. Basically, here, first of all, we, uh, I didn't mention the computational complexity, but if in the Euclidean case, uh, this multiplication by the Fourier basis can be, because of the redundancy, can be done in n log n operations using f of t. On graphs uh, where you don't usually have this structure, it requires order of n squared operations, right? No, I think there is a lot of, But uh, well, I think you still need some assumptions about the uh, about the graph. You need some locality, probably, or, or uh, some structure. You're probably talking about uh, about uh, Chazet uh, and uh, uh, Nero Elon, right? No, uh, the, the, no, no? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Dan Spielman things. Like Dan Spielman's worked on Laplacians for like decades. And I see. Yeah. Could be. But still, it doesn't solve the problem. So the, 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 the problem in the, in the original approach uh, is that the filters are not localized. Here, the filters are, are localized. Because Laplacian is local, if you take the power of the Laplacian, it will affect only uh, our neighbors uh, removed uh, at max. Exactly, exactly. So this is, a, this is a by definition, local filter. Exactly. This is, uh, this is local filter. The assumption is that local filters really tell you everything. You can still get a sparse representation in this. That's uh, that's correct. So uh, in some uh, in in some types of graphs like social networks, uh, the small world graphs, basically in a few steps you cover the entire graph. So in in these cases, uh, this is this is a very reasonable assumptions. In case of meshes, uh, it's a good question. Actually, the better model is uh, uh, rational filters. In signal processing terms, uh, we, we usually these are called FIR, finite impulse response, and these are IR, infinite impulse response. So it's similar to the filters. You also include uh, the, 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 the inverse of the matrix. And this can be approximately computed using, let's say, a Jacobi inversion. Yep. So I guess uh, I understand at a symbolic level what you're trying to do. But conceptually, can you step back and say, what is the, the analog you're trying to achieve for like what properties do you want to be able to compute for the data? So I want local filters. I want something that can be computed fast with uh, order of uh, n uh, multiplications. And you get it here, right? So you get local filters. You get uh, order of n multiplications because this matrix is sparse. Uh, uh, and you want, uh, you want also deformation invariants, right? So uh, Laplacian is intrinsic. So if the mesh deforms isometrically, then the, uh, the, the filter uh, produces exactly the same, the same response. But what is the isometric deformation? Doesn't changes the, the, the weights. So when when the mesh uh, deforms. That's what I'm worried about. Like in your horse example, the weights would change. Right? The, the, local, the local distances from the horse. Yeah. So the weights. Uh, so for these kind of filters, we can actually show that they are uh, uh, they are uh, insensitive to perturbations. We can bound the error. So it is it is very different from from this example. Because here we are not using explicitly the basis. Here we are applying the filter to the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Yep. But this local filter approximation, local features approximation, is actually a strong assumption on the type of inputs. That's right. So we, we, we obviously assume that. Vision is like that. I mean, yep. whether speech is like that. Yep. I actually believe that most successful neural networks are exactly on this type of thing. Yep. But there's a very strong assumption on a generating model. Of course. Of the, of the data. Of course, of course. So we assume that assume that uh, uh, you can you, you can infer something about global structure from the from the local features. Yeah. Sometimes half of the work. Yep. Yeah. I was asking more about like how do you define the mesh between two different reference photos of the horse? Do you have the photo and then you have a triangulation of uh, the image and then on the next time point you have a new triangulation? 
So in this case, in this case, it, uh, it's the same mesh, just the positions of the vertices uh, uh, change. So it was basically uh, somebody, uh, an animator, uh, moved the points in some way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the, sp the, the sparsity, the sparsity structure of the matrix remains the same, just the, the, the weights change. So these filters uh, actually are insensitive to these uh, 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 to these kind of uh, of perturbations of the so you have of the weights. One -to -one mapping between what the nodes are. So you have a correspondence between the nodes, and what you're saying is like an ideal computation would maintain uh, some level of the filter similar between similar things, even though they move. That's correct. That's correct. But but these filters also generalize uh, to uh, uh, to meshes where the connectivity is very different. So. This kind of example, where you, uh, I, I, I take the same structure, the same geometric structure, but I represent it as different meshes. I see. So in this case, you don't fix the mesh by a person that manually undertakes; you just generate the mesh. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So here, uh, basically, it was some uh, point cloud that was triangulated, and here the triangulation uh, was uh, was done differently from triangulation here. So it's uh, well, if you if you were to model basically the kind of relation that usually uh, that usually is assumed here, because obviously you don't have isomorphism, the number of vertices uh, is dramatically different. Usually, what people do in geometric processing and computer graphics is what is called a functional map. So it's a map between spaces of functions on on these domains, and you can assume that uh, you can represent it with respect to the Fourier basis. So you can represent it as as a, a matrix of 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 uh, fixed size, so basically it's a low rank approximation for this correspondence. And uh, you can assume that it's orthogonal. In this case, it's area preserving, which is a, a meaningful assumption for maps between, uh, between surfaces that, that you want to preserve, uh, preserve area. Uh, uh, okay, so let me, let, let me continue. Basically, if we look at the, uh, if we look at the uh, structure of these filters, if we go uh, for a second, if you go back to the, uh, to the Euclidean two-dimensional grid, we see that the filters that we obtain in this way through the Laplace N are uh, symmetric. They have rotation invariance. Which is not surprising, right? Because we know, of course, that two-dimensional Laplacian is invariant to rotations. And uh, this is also not surprising because uh, we, here we started with the assumption that uh, basically we have a graph, right? So in a graph, you, you don't have a canonical ordering of the vertices. You can reorder them uh, as you like, right? So the, the, the Laplacian itself, it takes an average of the neighbors. So it is, uh, it is oblivious to the ordering of the nodes. And, uh, Basically, these constructions work both on meshes on graphs. I'm, uh, I, I, I'm claiming that on meshes you can do better because on, on the meshes you don't have uh, permutation invariance, you have orientation invariance, right? I still don't know how to choose uh, uh, my first vertex on the mesh, but if I choose it, I can order all the rest of them, let's say, in, clo uh, in clockwise direction. Is right? it local rotation? Exactly, it's local rotation, right? Because, because meshes represent uh, continuous structures that are locally Euclidean, right? Basically, this is a, a, a surface, a two-dimensional manifold, and locally, uh, you can think of it as a, a plane, the tangent space, right? It's like a gauge transformation. Well, that's right, so some, some generalizations, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so basically, we have this ambiguity that, uh, uh, for example, here we don't have uh, any notion of direction. Or on the graph, on on the manifold or on the mesh, we, we can't have uh, a notion of direction. And a meaningful way of modeling it would be to attach some local system of coordinates. For example, uh, one uh, convenient system of coordinates is uh, geodesic polar coordinates. So basically, around each vertex, we have uh, uh, this system of coordinates, and in this system of coordinates, we can define a system of weights, weighting functions. So think of them as soft pixels. In uh, in on the Euclidean grid, you will have a patch of pixels, right, and you can. Uh, Say I have pixel number one, pixel number two. They are ordered in a certain way. So here, each blob will average the features at the nodes uh, around vertex i, and uh, these averages will serve as an analogy of pixels. And these uh, blobs can also be learnable. For example, we can model them as Gaussians with uh, learnable mean and, and covariance. Okay. So basically, we learn the filter parameters and uh, the, the parameters of these blobs. And here are some examples of uh, how they may look like. So. Here we can also orient them, and obviously everything is intrinsic because uh, all the construction uh, lives on the mesh. So uh, 
the direction here is with respect to some uh, tangent vector fields that, that, that we need to define uh, we need to define on this uh, on this manifold and here are some examples of how these uh, these weights may, may look like so uh, what you see on the right are learnable weights so they were optimized uh, together with the with the with the filter uh, with the filter coefficients uh, here are some examples of uh, what how it can be used in computer graphics applications so this is texture transfer so we have some reference shape and uh, we have this checkerboard texture and we use uh, basically we train the neural network to find the correspondence and transfer the, the texture using this correspondence so you see that it's almost perfect there are some minor distortions here but overall uh, this is very very good correspondence here are some uh, other examples so this is the the deviation from the ground truth basically how far uh, uh, our correspondence is from the from the from the uh, ground rules correspondence and uh, the way of measuring it, we can uh, see how many correspondences fall within certain tolerance radius without uh, 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 around the, the ground rules. And uh, you see that uh, it is almost perfect. So this is a standard way of uh, evaluating correspondence quality in, in computer graphics. So let me briefly talk about the, uh, how much time do I have actually? Well, we have the room until 1.30. 1.30, okay. Uh, so let me say a few words about the, the synthesis and then uh, I will finally move to, to proteins. Uh, so basically, once we find this correspondence, right, remember the, the motion capture problem, we want to deform the shape uh, to assume the right, uh, the right pose. And we did, with people from Google, we did uh, uh, the first intrinsic um, autoencoder architecture, which I think everything that could be done wrong uh, was done wrong here. Uh, basically, we, we, we assume here that the connectivity is given and uh, we uh, do a convolutional uh, encoder on the mesh to produce a latent space representation for, for, uh, for, for this uh, human shape. And then we have a decoder that again assumes the same connectivity. So essentially, it uh, does some local processing uh, on, the, uh, on the point coordinates using the, uh, using the given mesh. Now, once we train this, uh, uh, this encoder and decoder, we discard the encoder, we use the, uh, we'll use the latent space uh, to produce a plausibly looking human uh, human shapes, and then we uh, basically we do optimization in the latent space to, in order for the for the decoder output to match some given partial noisy input, right? So the encoder here is not used after it was trained for uh, uh, on on the training set, and here you can see some examples. So we used it for mesh completion for shape completion. So this is the partial noisy input, and this is the the completion result. This is probably not great, but uh, uh, at that time, three years ago, that was better than any state of the art. Here are some other examples. So you see that uh, uh, the face, for example, and the fingers are pretty, pretty badly predicted. But overall, we capture the, the structure of the shape. And uh, here, I thought you're actually using a model of the three D object already. So in order to complete the, you see part of it. So the input is this. It is it is partial. It is noisy. Exactly, but you need to, to produce, uh, uh, to basically to deform this mesh such that it, uh, it fits uh, the, the input. That's the problem we are trying to solve. And then, and then generalize. Yeah. So, uh, well, let me, let me uh, move uh, forward so we, uh, uh, we can do the usual things that you, uh, uh, that you do with, uh, with autoencoders. So we can uh, do interpolation or extrapolation between the latent factors. So we can generate, for example, uh, these uh, uh, intermediate or exaggerated expressions. Uh, we can do uh, arithmetics on shapes, so we can take uh, the expression of this person, subtract the neutral expression of the same person, add uh, the neutral expression of, the, of another person, and get the, the, the second person in, uh, in the facial expression of the first one. So again, nothing surprising. That's the, the usual things that you see also with word embeddings, for example. And uh, so this is more recent result. So here we have a mixed architecture where the encoder is uh, a two-dimensional CNN and the decoder is a mesh CNN. So uh, we can uh, very accurately reconstruct the 3D pose of a hand. And this actually works in real time. So we, we can deal with very challenging uh, uh, occurrences of hands in the wild. So the input here is an image and the output is a 3D, uh, 3D pose of the hand dealing with uh, occlusions, uh, partial information and so on. Okay, so let's talk about proteins. Any questions about this so far? So basically why, why proteins are interesting. Uh, proteins, some people call them the molecule of life. This is not, uh, not just a poetic description, really uh, any form of life that we know 
uh, nowadays uh, is based on proteins. We, 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 we are not aware of any other forms of life. And uh, proteins, uh, the, the, the part of gene genetic code that at least we understand uh, what it does, uh, is used to encode proteins. Uh, it is triplets of uh, nucleotides in the DNA that uh, represent an amino acid, and there is a special chemical mechanism that reads out these uh, sequences and, and produces a sequence of amino acids that uh, then uh, folds into a structure. And uh, proteins uh, encountered in a lot of mechanisms in our body, whether it's uh, defense against pathogens, antibodies or proteins, uh, storage and transport of, let's say, oxygen. Hemoglobin is also a protein that, 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 that binds oxygen. Uh, uh, transport of different substances ac across, let's say, cell membranes. Uh, structure, so collagen in our uh, skin is also protein. Uh, uh, catalysis, basically many chemical reactions would not be possible without proteins acting as, uh, as catalysts, and, and so on and so forth. So chemically speaking, uh, protein is just a sequence of amino acids. They're attached in a sequence. And then by virtue of uh, uh, attraction and repulsion forces, they uh, form uh, secondary and tertiary structures. So typically you see these, uh, these flat sheet-like structures and spiral or helix-like structures. And uh, a good analogy is the snake toy where you can, uh, it's a one-dimensional structure, but you can rotate and fold it into different shapes. And one of the classical problems in uh, bioinformatics that is notoriously difficult is uh, predicting the 3D structure from uh, the sequence of amino acids, what is called protein folding. Uh, some recent uh, Remarkable pro progress uh, has been done by DeepMind. So this is a Nature paper where they published the, the, the alpha fold uh, 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 that, that, that allows to predict uh, basically the distances between the, between uh, 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 between different amino acids that that uh, allows to, to reconstruct the structure. Another classical problem is docking. We are given two proteins and we try to understand the three D alignment, basically how they will stick together. And uh, a good analogy for this is a lock and the key. Basically, a lock has uh, this uh, three-dimensional structure of pins, and uh, there is only one key that will fit into this uh, into this structure. So here's an example how it looks at, uh, looks in proteins. So this is a three-dimensional structure, how the protein appears from the outside, and there is this small molecule that fits into this pocket. Uh, and so it's not only geometric complementarity; it's also uh, the, the electrostatic forces that uh, make it fit. As, as a key into a lock. So in a sense, uh, designing proteins is uh, an inverse, uh, inverse uh, folding. We want to, uh, to have certain 3D structure, and we are asking what is the uh, sequence that will produce this structure. And usually in, in, in protein design, uh, this is a simplified version of this problem. We don't really care about uh, the overall structure of the protein. We are interested in just one small piece. So some site that will bind. Usually it's only a small part of the protein. All the rest is not interesting. So usually we're interested in, in these small seeds, the, 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 the small binders, and all the rest is, uh, is constructed around. Why this is, is important? Uh, well, structure and function is intimately related in proteins. And uh, uh, protein, uh, protein binding has crucial, uh, 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 crucial implications for drug design. So this is just one example of, uh, uh, of uh, a new class of drugs that were uh, also awarded the, the Nobel Prize in Medicine uh, two years ago, uh, what is called immunotherapy. So basically, uh, in particular, uh, part of the prize went for the discovery of this PD, uh, uh, PD complex. Uh, uh, you can see it here. Basically, what happens is that uh, we have uh, uh, immune cells in our body, right, that kill uh, pathogens and, and, uh, and uh, bad things that, that, uh, that, that develop. Why uh, don't uh, uh, these T cells attack our own cells, what, what is called the uh, uh, autoimmune disease? Because there is a special protective mechanism. So there, there is this, uh, uh, um, uh, the, this complex of proteins, and uh, uh, these pro when they, these proteins bind, they deactivate the T cell. Uh, I think it's called uh, immune checkpoint uh, in, in medicine. Uh, what happens is that we always, uh, our body naturally produces uh, cancer cells. Most of them are killed naturally by, uh, by the immune system. It happens that some of cancer cells develop these, uh, these proteins and basically they block, uh, inhibit the T cell and the, then the, the, the tumor grows and then we need uh, medical attention and maybe, maybe even die. From it, so the immunotherapy works by blocking uh, one of these proteins, either uh, PD1 or PDL1, 
And this way, it allows the, the T cell to, to attack the, the, the tumor cell and, uh, and destroy it. So the crucial step here is how to design a binder for, for this target. And this is just one example. There are many other targets. Most of the drugs are uh, molecules that are designed to bind to some protein and disrupt or activate some chemical, chemical reaction. So if you think of proteins of, as uh, 3D structures, uh, again, here we have uh, different uh, choices for representing them. So you can think of them as uh, just a point cloud of atoms, right? We can think of them as what a chemist called the stick diagram, basically a graph representing chemical bonds. Uh, some higher order structures, secondary structures, what uh, uh, chemists call ribbon diagrams. Or we can think of them as a molecular surface. And what we argue in our paper that uh, this representation is natural for predicting interactions uh, between proteins because it abstracts all the unnecessary details of how the protein is folded inside. Because it doesn't matter. When a binder comes here, uh, the binder w doesn't know what happens inside. It doesn't care what happens inside, how exactly the, 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 the protein is folded. What matters only is what is accessible from the outside. So these representations can be very wasteful. Here we are interested only in the outside surface. And that's where the, the it fit your key example. The key is large enough. Well, why not? Why not? So the key here, the key will fit here, right? So the the, the inside will be uh, there will be some pockets here in the surface as well. So it's not it's not only geometric structure. It's uh, there are also some some uh, some electrostatic features. Physical well. interaction more important. The local interaction. That's right. So the. So that's, that's an extra complication. Basically, what happens is when the proteins interact, they also deform. So the bound and unbound proteins can sometimes be dramatically different. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, well, I, I, will, I will get to the end of the, the, the talk. We have some results that show that uh, actually we, 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 we have some, some issues with this. But still, uh, I hope to convince you that we can do remarkably well uh, ignoring this, uh, this problem. Right? So basically, what we try to do, we try to uh, to think of proteins as surfaces and uh, to use uh, these geometric deep learning techniques to try to extract descriptors that, uh, uh, that can be informative of the interaction between the proteins. So uh, again, this is how uh, the, the architecture looks like. So we extract patches from the surface, we compute on them uh, geometric and, and chemical features, and uh, basically apply one or several uh, geometric convolutional layers plus maybe some task-specific layers. So it's a very simple uh, neural network that, that, uh, that works with these, uh, with these meshes. OK, so uh, this is a, a little bit poetic uh, visualization of how it works, that uh, we are lucky enough to get to the, to the cover of Nature Methods in this February issue. So here you can see uh, a pair of proteins and, uh, and these uh, small patches and the neural network. That, that So that was. Uh, uh, a, a desperate cry because we were ditched by two illustrators. So that was a friend that, that does watercolor painting, and somehow uh, it got to the, to, the, to the cover of nature. So uh, I will show three applications where we use this, uh, this architecture. So uh, three problems in, um, in, in protein design. One is uh, interface site prediction. So we look at the protein, we try to predict which uh, parts of the protein will, uh, are likely to bind. So usually they look like pockets, but not necessarily. And here, actually, important question is, is how it goes beyond the training examples that we've seen, how well it generalizes. Then a slightly more complicated problem, not only saying whether this, uh, uh, the, uh, there is an interaction here, but also with what kind of a binder. In this case, we consider uh, seven small molecules, what are called cofactors, so vitamins are uh, an example of such such cofactors, and finally, uh, fast PPI search. So this is uh, the, uh, a step that is important for drug design when we have a target, and you try to find uh, uh, the, the the right uh, uh, protein that will bind to this target out of a collection of millions of examples. Yeah. That's correct. So the input is a mesh. The input is a mesh. So the input comes, yeah. So the input, uh, 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 the structure of the protein is known from uh, from X-ray crystallography, yeah, usually. So, like, you create the mesh, or it comes to you as mesh? Like, so we use standard, uh, we use standard software to generate the mesh. It's uh, it's pretty straightforward. So from from the uh, atomic point cloud, you can generate the mesh. That's correct. Yep. Just want to pause back to the one who asked the same question, but is this cryo-EM data 
No, it's not cryo-EM, it's X-ray crystallography. So for uh, for proteins, I don't know the exact number, but I think uh, probably uh, hundred thousand uh, structures are known. So here it's slightly more complicated because we needed uh, co-crystallized proteins, basically uh, pairs of proteins that that uh, uh, that bind together. So that's uh, less. That's probably around ten thousand. So what do you call by 2D mapping? So for example, in a more classical bioinformatics, people will start with a string of letters and then they would apply some basic... Uh, so 1D. Uh, 1D. 1D, yeah. 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 Uh, and there would be this uh, uh, simple rules or error of electrostatic flow between different classes of amino acids, and they would build a 2D model from that. Uh, and I was wondering like, if you would do some uh, simpler version of formation, it's not going to be in this 2D model, do you find certain rules here that are surprising with respect to what you could do with a simple representation? So, so uh, again, I'm I'm not an expert. Uh, so uh, uh, take it with a grain of salt. I'm aware of uh, works that use one-dimensional sequences, try to predict interactions from one-dimensional sequences. Usually, uh, it takes also uh, 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 evolutionary uh, uh, data. So you, you have uh, aligned sequences of many proteins from different species that have similar structures, but uh, and, and similar sequences. Uh, we don't use it all together. So we, we use just single example of a single protein, we're discarding altogether the, the evolutionary data. Yeah, and here's the question, I was referring to that work. That, like, the, the I think this is Brandon Fry, right, from Toronto. And, uh, and the Bramarx from, uh, from Harvard Medical School actually has some work on this. But I was just wondering in terms of like the type of interactions you uncover here, are there um, a subset or a superset of those interactions you would find with that? So I don't know. In principle, the, the sequence of amino acids contains everything, right? If you know how to do the folding, you also have the 3D structure, and from 3D structure, you can predict the interactions. Uh, it might be uh, ex too, too complicated to do it. So, yeah. So, uh, and uh, let's say the, the, uh, an example of what we would like to do is, let's say if we have a, a, a cancer target, right? So PD-1 or PDL one protein, we'll first identify where it binds. And then we have uh, an example of uh, small seeds. We'll find which seeds, uh, seed uh, matches it, and then we'll uh, do geometric alignments to find, uh, uh, basically to, 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 to find the entire complex, uh, how the, 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 the two things are aligned. So let's start with the first problem of interface site prediction. Basically, it's point-wise binary classification problem. We want for each point on the mesh to tell whether it, uh, it's an interface or not. So uh, the training set here are examples of, uh, basically, we have pairs of proteins that are crystallized together. So nearby points are considered uh, as a, basically a point that, that is, uh, uh, is close to, 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 the, to the other protein is considered as interacting. And uh, the performance criteria here is uh, area under the, the ROC curve. We use uh, uh, open, so open uh, um, public domain data, uh, about 3,000 co-crystallized proteins, 90% uh, for training, 10% for testing. And this is the typical uh, 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 way the results look like. So the heat map shows the likelihood of a point to be an interface. The green uh, uh, shows the, the ground truth. That's where the, the actual interface is. And you see that the predictions are pretty good. So the, the, we get an ROC around uh, 85%, so this is a typical example. Uh, question? Uh, so this, this is uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the distribution of scores for uh, interface uh, points and non-interface points, some ablation studies. The same, the same Laplacian. So it doesn't use Laplacian. No, it uses the, these uh, local uh, orientation sensitive coordinates. Yeah. Uh, Ablation study, we use uh, different combinations of features, chemical or geometric. We see that uh, using both produces uh, the best results. And here are some examples. So these are interesting examples. So to me, uh, it is not obvious because I don't work on proteins, but my collaborators that work on proteins and actually were those that designed this protein tell that this is, uh, the, 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 this is a big deal because what you see here is basically it is, um, it, it is an attempt to design a vaccine against influenza. 
uh, in particular the, the, that, that uh, bad uh, type of influenza, the, the H1N1, that, uh, that is called the Spanish flu. Basically, it's a protein, a viral protein from, the, from that virus. And uh, basically, what, uh, what they try to do here is to emulate, uh, uh, basically to take an innocuous protein uh, and re-engineer it in a way that it looks like, uh, uh, like the, the viral protein, so it will elicit immune response. And next time you're exposed to the virus, then uh, the, the, your immune system will respond to it and, and, and uh, you will not get sick. So the, the wild type is the, uh, is the protein that occurs in nature, and you see that it doesn't bind. We basically, we don't have any signal uh, here. And this is the design protein. And I don't know, it's hard to see probably, but you don't really see much change from here to here. And here we get a very strong, uh, uh, very strong response. So basically our uh, neural network predicts that we have a binding site here. And this doesn't look like a typical pocket. It looks almost flat. So th that was actually a very, very interesting example that, uh, that is, uh, doesn't appear in the training set. So uh, again, my collaborators that, that, that see these proteins all the time, they say that uh, this is a very non-trivial example of, of generalization. So uh, apparently the neural network has learned something meaningful. Here is another example. So this is, uh, again, influenza inhibitor. So uh, this is the wild type and this is the design. So again, after the, the, uh, the, the design protein that, that, uh, that, that binds to the, to the target, shows very strong uh, uh, interface signal. Some other examples. So this is an interesting example of proteins that assemble together and form some 3D cage. And uh, maybe it's noisier, but still it's, it's a good prediction. We, we tried architectures with multiple layers, so uh, the results are slightly better. A comparison to some state-of-the-art algorithm that uh, performs significantly worse. Uh, so here's an example. The spider is uh, completely uh, unable to produce anything, anything meaningful. And basically, these methods uh, uh, work well when you have uh, examples of similar proteins, basically, when, uh, because they rely on, on, on similar sequences. Uh, and when you don't have something where, basically, when you are trying to design a de novo protein that hasn't been, been seen before in nature, uh, these traditional methods do not work. Yep. Uh, so, here in your, in your training data, you have the protein structure and you also have uh, the mesh. And for each part of the uh, mesh or a cell, you have some annotation with features like this is hydrophobic. And That's correct. That's right. So basically, we compute uh, electrostatic uh, features uh, 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 like hydrophobicity and uh, poisson uh, Boltzmann. But those are given. So, so you get the mesh, and then you know which amino acid kind of like corresponds to which part of the surface, and then you compute these characteristics. That's right. Yep. You get the, the design protein that you get is not one that you uh, design with this principle in mind, in the sense like you don't do it in a latent space. Do you think you can do it in latent so, uh, space? Well, we, we don't, uh, I didn't get to the design as well. So design, unfortunately, it's not a generative model. We, we don't do design like this. So the design is given by the biologists that studied these proteins for a long time, and they know, oh, if I modify this part, I would expect to enhance these properties in this law. Right. And so you get the new mesh, and you find the closest one in your data. Structure. That's correct. Yeah, so we, we, we find the seeds. And then around the seeds, we build the scaffold that, uh, that basically g g gives so gives. us. So that's the next step. Uh, OK, so let me skip these examples. So well, uh, uh, the, the, these are um, uh, some other examples where uh, we obviously perform better. So this is a, a, a slightly more complicated problem, the, 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 the pocket classification. So here, instead of binary classes, we have seven classes. So these are the small molecules that bind to, to, to these particular pockets. And uh, the important thing to note here that some of them are extremely similar. So this one, for example, and uh, NADP and NAD, are, look the same with the exception of this, uh, this thing that, that is different. So it is very similar. So these pockets, uh, uh, these pockets uh, look very similarly. And nevertheless, one binds to an AD and another one binds to an ADP. And they're very selective. So they, 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 don't, uh, they don't make this mistake. Uh, uh, so again, uh, similar problem setting. Uh, one important thing to know that uh, we need to carefully uh, design the training and the test sets uh, in a way that we don't have uh, similar uh, proteins. So uh, basically, the proteins in the training and the test set uh, 
are, uh, are dissimilar. So we don't. We, 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 otherwise, the problem is easier because uh, we have similar, stru similar structures in, in training and setting, and the generalization is, is straightforward. So we did actually some uh, some studies where we uh, we uh, controlled the split of the training and the test set based on the. On, uh, on homology between the protein sequences, so uh, we uh, we have these results in the paper. That, that's uh, that, that's uh, important uh, uh, technical detail uh, that, that has to be uh, to be taken into account. So here is the confusion matrix. So we see that that we can uh, classify them pretty well. Again, combination of geometric and chemical features produces the best results. And here is an example of how uh, a pocket looks like. So uh, these are. Uh, two different parts of the surface. One binds uh, NADP and another one binds uh, NAD. And you see that we get, uh, basically here, red means that it binds to NAD. So we have strong signal that is specific for, for, this, uh, for this binder. So the last application I wanted to show is uh, fast protein-to-protein uh, -protein interaction search. And if the analogy before was a lock and the key, here we have multiple locks and multiple keys. And uh, here what we are trying to do, we try to find uh, descriptors that would allow to do uh, to do docking basically the uh, descriptors that are informative of the of the uh, of the protein binding so it's a siamese a neural network that is trained with triplet loss on uh, examples of uh, uh, of uh, 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 corresponding and non corresponding uh, corresponding patches on the proteins and uh, here is an example. So we have a binder and a target. So it, it has complementary geometric and chemical features. And this is some random patch that is not supposed to be similar to the binder. And what we want to do is that the descriptor at the binder and the target is as similar as possible. And at random patch is as dissimilar as possible. So the, the usual thing that is done in, in, uh, with these architectures. So you see that there is a very nice separation between uh, uh, interacting and non-interacting patches. So this is the distance between the descriptors. Again, with a uh, combination of geometric and chemical features, we can achieve area under the curve of uh, about 99%. So this is uh, uh, this is very uh, very high accuracy, and uh, we use it to to, to find uh, basically to align these uh, these complexes. So this part is ugly. Uh, we use it using Ransack. We basically we first compute the descriptors and then uh, use standard geometric alignment techniques from computer vision literature, we already have results where this is replaced by a differentiable alignment uh, that is part of the neural network and everything is trained end to end. So here are some examples. So uh, this is large scale docking. Basically, we look at how many complexes out of, let's say, 100 we can, we can resolve. So the most important numbers uh, to look at this. So basically, that's the, the fraction out of 100, how many complexes are resolved. So we compare to page doc, let's say, that uh, is state of the art. So we do better, but also we do faster. So compared to other methods, it's orders of magnitude faster. So uh, this can, uh, can make a practical large-scale search of, uh, of, uh, 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 for multiple protein-to-protein -protein interactions. So let me, before I finish, let me show you just a few uh, results. So to convince biologists, uh, you need to, to, to show structure. So that's, that's the painful part. This is the very frustrating part also because you can design a protein computationally in a few days maybe, but then it takes half a year to, 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 uh, to express it. It is expressed in the living cell, in, usually in yeast. So the way that it's done, you, you get a sequence, or a DNA strand that encodes the protein, then it's ingested by the, by the organism and the organism starts producing these proteins, then it has to be extracted. So there are many uh, chemical and biological problems with that. But the bottom line, you can get uh, the, the protein. And here we have, for the pdl one target, we have uh, three designs. The fourth, we, we did four designs. The fourth didn't work yet. Uh, but still, it's good. 75% uh, uh, heat rate in this field is, is amazing. And you see that they are all very different. So even though they bind to the same side, so this has, uh, basically, this has a, a ribbon stru uh, structure, so it's, uh, it's flat. This one uh, has a single helix along the, the interface, and this one has double helix uh, across the interface. So they're as different as, uh, as one, one can think. So here are examples of binding. So the way that it, it works, you change the concentration of the protein, and then you, you, you measure how, uh, uh, basically how strongly it binds. So uh, there are uh, uh, good binding signals here. Uh, what usually people uh, uh, for, for drug design usually look at uh, very low concentrations. So what is called nanomolar binding. So we are at the same order of magnitude. So probably not in the range of, of drugs, but close to that. 
And here, finally, we have X-ray uh, crystal structure for one of the designs. Hopefully, the others are coming as well. Uh, so uh, it is almost perfect, uh, perfectly corresponding to the uh, to, to the uh, to the computational design. Uh, uh, the overall error is less than one angstrom, and you can see that the orange and the, and the red uh, structures are uh, are the the, the, the the computed and the uh, and the one obtained uh, from from X-ray crystallography. So it, it really it is what it, what was designed, and it does what it's supposed to do. No, it's not one atom. So it's uh, basically uh, we get uh, we get uh, 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 okay, less than one uh, one angstrom. Yeah. So basically, these structures are aligned, and of course, the the one that you get experimentally is not exactly the one that is is computed, but it is very close. So for uh, from from what what I hear from my collaborators, uh, this is uh, uh, more more than uh, good enough. To, to basically, uh, this uh, solves any doubts. That th that's that's what it is. Okay, so let me summarize and stop here. Uh, basically, this is a new set of techniques uh, for uh, uh, for protein science. So it doesn't use any uh, any uh, evolutionary history, evolutionary uh, basically uh, multiple sequences of, pro of proteins with a similar structure. Uh, we can use the same architecture for different tasks. So we can uh, use it for predicting interfaces. We can use it uh, for uh, for fast protein-to-protein uh, -protein interaction search. Uh, the challenge uh, is, uh, as, as you mentioned, um, basically when the proteins bind, uh, they uh, can deform. Sometimes this deformation is dramatic. So that's why the performance on, basically we have two tables. What is called APO is the unbound. So when we train, we assume that the proteins come co-crystallized, so they, they are in bound state. When we actually look for the partner for a protein, it is crystallized independently, so it's unbound. And that's why the performance is significantly worse here. So uh, we are not accounting at all for this uh, uh, for, for issue, and probably one way of dealing with it would be with uh, simple data augmentation. So we want to deform the proteins and, and add them to the, to the training set. Question? When you're done. Yeah. Uh, so we have experimental validation, and more is coming. So we have uh, crystal structure. We have uh, some uh, uh, ongoing experience with, uh, with, uh, with cells, actually with human uh, cancer cells. So it will be cool to, to, show, uh, uh, to show examples there. And maybe at some point, we'll also uh, get in vivo results, maybe with, uh, with, with mice or with, even with human patients. That, that's probably. Many years away. <laughs> okay, so I will stop here. And uh, the, these are uh, many collaborators that, that have been uh, working on these and other projects. So thank you very much.